welcome to a very special event here at the Zoological Society of London as we celebrate British Science Week. We're coming to you live from behind the scenes at ZSL, based in London, England. My name is Charlotte and I'll be your host tonight as we give you the opportunity to see a post-mortem of a common dolphin happening in real time. We really welcome your questions and comments throughout the event, so please do tweet us using the hashtag CSI of the C. And if you're not on Twitter, don't worry, you can still send us an email with your questions, which is learning at zsl.org. And we will try and get through as many of those questions as we can over the next hour and a half of the event. For those of you who aren't aware, the Zoological Society of London is a conservation, research and education charity that was first established in 1826. We run two zoos, ZSL London Zoo and ZSL Whipsnade Zoo, and are involved in conservation programmes in over 50 countries across the world. But we also run the Institute of Zoology, where all our scientific researchers are based. And it's those scientists, a couple of those scientists, that we're going to be hearing from tonight. Because I am joined by Rob Deville and also Matt Perkins, who appear to be in different areas of the room right now. <laughs> so <laughs> but, come together. Uh, <laughs> But Rob, you are the project manager of the Station Strandings Investigation Programme. I am for my sins, yes. First of all, what do we mean by the term cetacean? So this is a cetacean in front of us. Mm -hmm. uh, cetaceans are it's a collective name for whales, dolphins and porpoises. Right. And the Cetacean Strandings, Strandings Investigation Programme, it is. Yeah. I'm going to refer to it from now on as CSIP. Yeah. What exactly is that and why was it first set up? Well, beyond an excuse to have CSI on all our branded logos, then it's, um, it was set up in 1990 by the then Department of Environment, and it's currently funded by DEFRA and by the governments of Scotland and Wales, and we're contracted to investigate and monitor strandings around the UK coast, retrieve a proportion uh, for post-mortem examination, try and establish a cause of death, and really interested in the man-made drivers of mortality, things like bycatch, ship strike, exposure to marine pollution, that kind of thing, and that's essentially why we do this work. Well, your work isn't always in the confines of the post-mortem room. Sometimes you, you have to actually go to the animal that is stranded because it's so large. And we've got um, an image, slide three, of a very large uh, whale uh, stranded on the beach. Um, when we talk about strandings, presumably they can be alive or, or dead. Yes, I guess some context here would be useful. Every year in the UK we get around six to 700 strandings of cetaceans. We've also got a slide of that, which we can hopefully bring up for viewers, which is slide four. Carry and on. <laughs> okay, so about 90% of all those stranding events involve dead animals, but we do get a significant proportion of live stranded animals too, and there's a different set of responses to those in terms of either rescue, refloat, or euthanasia. But our remit for government is essentially investigation of dead animals, how they died, and what can we learn from that. Okay, well, as, as well as you, Rob, we're also joined um, by Matt. Um, Matt, I know that you've been working uh, on this programme for over 15 years. Yeah, You're a senior technician yes. here <laughs> at the Zoological Society of London. Did you ever imagine you'd end up doing a job like this? How did you get into it? Um, that's a very good question. I'm not even sure I have the answer anymore. It's been such a long time ago. Um, so I kind of did a general biology degree. Um, at Anglia Ruskin University. Nice plug. Um, <laughs> and um, when I kind of finished university and I knew I wanted to get into marine biology, um, I also had a bit of an interest in human pathology. Mm -hmm. um, when a job came up working here um, and it seemed to be perfect and somehow I got the job. So okay. um, I do work on a lot of other things as well, not just this. So it's, all okay. it's a, a bit, bit of easy. variety to yeah. the job. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, we'll, we'll be hearing more from you yeah. later on, um, Matt. Uh, what we are going to be doing this evening, though, is focusing on a particular uh, cause of stranding, which is bycatch. Um, Rob, you're a good person to ask, what do we mean by the term bycatch? So one definition of bycatch would be the incidental entrapment of non-target species. So what do we mean by that? When you go out fishing for a target fish, let's say, you accidentally may catch other species by accident as well. And it's important to point out these are accidental catches. Nobody deliberately sets out to catch these things. So you could buy, have bicaught seabirds, bicaught seals, and of course, bicaught cetaceans. Well, this is the animal that we're going to be focusing on tonight. Mm. Um, it's a common dolphin. What's the background to this case, Rob? We do have a, a map showing where 
where yeah. it's stranded and also a couple of photos of the animal on mm. the beach. So this um, turned up at a place called Tor Abbey Sands in South Devon near Torquay I think on the 23rd of February. It was found floating just offshore and then stranded. Uh, local public and we have reports from various parties as well and it's picked up by the local authority, took it to their depot. We retrieved it, brought it back here and it's been in our fridge ever since, awaiting attention tonight. Right. Well, can you tell us a little bit more, I guess, about common dolphins in, in general? Because mm. their term would suggest that, that they're common. Is that the case in the UK? Right, yeah. So, uh, I guess if we go back to that idea of six or seven hundred strandings a year, the most common species we see is the harbour porpoise. That's about a half of all the strandings we see. Second most common is the common dolphin. Uh, maybe about 100 to 150 strandings each year. Where do we see them? Mainly around the southwest and surrounding regions. We've got a map of this as well that we can, we can bring up to show okay. that. With the maps online now, you can see we've had strandings in the southwest, but we also get increasing strandings further north. And that's quite interesting. So the common dolphin is traditionally a warmer water species, mm -hmm. and we're seeing increasing strandings further north because we have a 27-year time series in the project, a north-south distribution. So more strandings of warm water species further north could be some evidence of climate change-driven impacts. Uh, in terms of common, it's a difficult one to answer. So I went back to look at some of the latest reference material from the SCANS3 survey, which is a very large international survey effort by uh, an international team across the North Sea and around the UK and other regions. And the latest estimate from that is about half a million population size, but it's large confidence intervals because these guys are quite hard study in the wild. Well, fantastic that you can actually see changes in, in where these animals are, are stranding and, and presumably therefore where they're, they're found out at sea just from, mm. from having all of that data that you've collected over the years. I guess it shows why it's so important to have a long-running programme like this. Yeah, absolutely. So again, as further context, we've had 22 species recorded stranded in the UK over 27 years, and that's about a quarter of the world's known total, which makes sense if you think about it. We've got a range of habitats around the UK, shallow coastal seas, deeper water mm -hmm. and then very deep continental shelf edge where you see things like sperm whales and beach whales. So it's actually one of the most species diverse regions of northwest Europe. Wow. Well, um, I know you've already actually started the post-mortem process or, mm. or necropsy is often referred to to non-human animals um, yeah. and that involves an external examination of yeah. the animal. So what have you been able to find out so far about this, this individual in particular? Okay, well, let's start with the nutritional condition. If we can get the camera sort of looking down that way, down the length of the animal, we call that the skyline view. So if you can see that the flanks are nice and rounded. So cetacean's natural state of being is to be nice and fat. They're happiest when they're fattest. So fattest would be roundest, uh, moderate condition would be flat, and then hollow, but that would be poor nutritional condition. It's a very crude assessment of nutritional condition. This is a juvenile on the base of length. So... They're born May to September-ish, and they reach sexual maturity about 10 to 11 years old. Maximum lifespan is about 35-ish. Mm -hmm. On the base of length, because we've seen a lot of them before, we'll probably say this is a juvenile animal. Okay. What we can see, very obviously from the outside, well, let's deal with some of the natural marks, first of all. Uh, over here, if you have the camera on this side, this oval lesion, this is a, a, a tattoo lesion, it's nicknamed, is consistent with infection with pox virus. And same way that we get viral infections or diseases when we're younger, it's a taste to get them too. So it'd be an, an incidental finding. Over here, we can see these little parallel marks. These are called rake marks. They're made when cetacean teeth interact with the skin. Mm. If we actually look at the teeth, you can see they're very pointed, and that reflects how they chase their prey, the fish down. We can look at the spacing and see these are made by the same species. And again, it happened for a variety of different reasons, and they're healed, so it's an incidental finding. The most significant thing, however, are all these marks around the body. Should we go into that? Um, yeah, although one other question I wanted to ask you is, I, I know you also take a lot of measurements of, of the animal beforehand as well. Yeah, so we take a standard uh, length measurement from the tip of the beak to the tail notch, and then encircling girth measurement too. We've taken some measurements for a student in Ireland looking at dorsal fin morphology and a weight too. All that goes into our data set. Brilliant. Okay, well, yeah, go on to the other marks that you've been able to see as well. Well, to be honest, it's fairly obvious when we saw the pictures of this animal on the beach that it would be a good candidate for tonight, to be honest. So it's heavily covered in net marks. Mm -hmm. We have the camera over here, first of all. We have these encircling linear marks around the head and then also running under the body. We've got some on 
the dorsal fin. So you can see these linear cuts on this side. And again, going further back around the tail fluke, we've got some bleeding linear cuts just over here. And if I lift the tail up, actually much more obvious, got one running that way. Okay, and there are also some more on the underside of the body too. So it's heavily covered in these linear man-made lesions, which are consistent with net marks. So what we've done already is actually measured the circumferential ones in particular. They're really useful mm. in terms of trying to diagnose the kind of gear they get caught in. Perhaps if I can yeah. illustrate that. Thanks, Charlotte. Okay, so I was um, on the beach with some friends in Cornwall fairly recently. We found lots of debris on the beach side, so we picked up some fragments of gear to help illustrate tonight's event. So this is a monofilament uh, tangle netting, if you like, and then we've got different kinds of trawl netting here with different mesh spacings and different widths. Not all these will be implicated in cetacean bycatch, but hopefully this just illustrates that we get different kinds of gear, we'll get different kinds of net marks. So Can we you ma match up the marks on the animal then with with the gear? Yeah, so that's what we're trying, well we can diagnose bycatch fairly readily, what we're really trying to get more involved in now is diagnosing the kind of fishery that's capturing these animals. So to generalise for a second, take a step back, mm -hmm. harbour porpoises we think are predominantly caught in monofilament type gear. So this is a tangle net, you might sink it on the seabed, sink it for a day to two weeks. It's a passive form of fishing so you catch whatever swims into it. Mm -hmm. And that's why porpoises, which are feeding the seabed, are more at risk potentially being caught in this gear. Common dolphins might be more liable to be caught in trawl-type gear, where you're towing a net behind one or two boats, and they're capturing different fish. And obviously, common dolphins feed on different prey species compared to porpoises, so you might get common dolphins more likely to be caught in trawl-type gear. Having said that, there is a lot of bleed between the two. So we get some porpoises caught in trawl-type gear, some dolphins caught in monofilament-type gear. And what's important in relation to these marks, as I was saying, is we measure the circumferential marks and then measure the width of the marks. We can hopefully try and relate it to the kind of gear they're caught in. What we'll do after tonight's event is we'll liaise with our, our colleagues at the Sea Mammal Research Unit. They do a lot of research on bycatch and they have a bycatch observer scheme that actually work on fishing vessels, record what's caught. They can probably give us more indication or information perhaps on what kind of gear it might have been caught in. Well, we've got a couple of other slides to show you at this point. Uh, two tables, slide 9 and slide 10 for those behind the scenes. Um, but this gives you an idea of the, the causes of death, but also um, the number of animals that have been diagnosed as, as bycatch cases mm. in the UK. Is it a big issue, Rob? Yeah, it is. I mean, that's a simple answer. Mm. So 27 years has been a consistent finding year in, year out. It's the major, it's the most important cause of direct anthropogenic mortality, man-made mortality across all species over 27 years. I think about 700 plus cases now. So yes, it certainly is. And that's out, just put that in context again, that's out, out of about 4,000 post-mortem examinations. So a significant cause of mortality. Different species, different threats. So for example, common dolphins been disproportionately impacted by bycatch. In some years, around 70% common dolphins we've examined have died due to bycatch. In contrast with porpoises, it's a lower number, maybe about 15 to 20 percent. Okay, well, you've done your external examination and you've obviously taken lots of measurements. These have all been noted down as well before we started. Mm. What happens next? Okay, so we'll roll it over onto its right-hand side. We've made some notes and some photographs, as you say. Mm -hmm. And we always do the post-mortem examination on its right side, just like us, their hearts are displaced laterally to the left. This makes it easy to access the heart. And I should state as well from the outset that our project's been going since 1990. There are various other projects like ours around Europe. We're all doing the same thing, following the same protocol, so we can integrate our data in the future and have much more power to address these questions of conservation concern. As we can see now, moving on to its uh, right side, there are more visible net marks on the ventral abdomen here, here, and here, with some post-mortem lividity. This is just discoloration after death. So, thanks for that. As the camera will show you, we actually have a fairly simple kit. <laughs> it's just a couple of very sharp scalpels and some forceps, scissors, 
calipers and some loppers over there. So it is actually a fairly simple kit. The most important piece of kit that we will have during the post-mortem is actually our heads because it's experience that guides you in this. I should point out now, uh, facing up, I'm not a vet, I'm an ologist, mm -hmm. uh, cytologist. I've been doing this for about 20 years though, so I have a lot of experience. So I will be able to look at these animals and say what's outside of the norm. And that's essentially pathology, in what way are things outside of the norm. Okay. So we'll begin by taking a piece of blubber off the outside. And we're going to measure that at three points. We're going to measure it dorsal at the top, lateral at the side, ventral underneath. And then that's going to give us some numbers to go into our database. Okay. So that is, for Matt's benefit, that is 19, Matt? Yeah. Uh, 17 and 21. Okay, if you show the camera over here, they've got a very thick skin, that's the black stuff, and this white stuff, that's the blubber layer. And the blubber serves two broad purposes. It's insulation from the colder water, because it is quite cold now, so it very seasonally in the summer it'll be thinner, winter it'll be thick, uh, thicker. And it's also an energy store, so when the animal goes under through nutritional stress, so it's not feeding, begin to mobilise that blubber layer. What we can see from this, and I know from experience, is that's actually quite a good blubber layer, given the size of the animal and the time of year. And there's also some subcutaneous fat just here, which again, you'd only see an animal that's uh, otherwise healthy. So as we go through this post-mortem process, we'll build up a picture of this animal and what's going on. We'll talk through how that might relate to bycatch. So bicycle animals tend to be healthy. Mm -hmm. They're fat, healthy, feeding, and there's a evidence of acute death. So that's tick, I guess, for that first part of this. Okay. We also collect a whole range of samples as we go through the post-mortem, because as I said earlier, uh, we're interested in how they've died, but we also want to learn more about how they've lived. And a dead animal on the beach, it is a sad event. Thanks, Matt. But it gives us a chance to try and collect a whole range of samples which sheds light on the life. This is the first one, that's skin for some genetic analysis. And so, for example, we're trying to look at how this individual fits in with the overall population. You know, how is it any different from the rest of the population? Is there evidence of population structuring? So that's the kind of thing we're doing. And this is all information that you wouldn't be able to collect without carrying out a necropsy. You can do some things, so you can do biopsies of live animals at sea, so you can get a skin and a blubber sample, so you can do that. But then what we can do is we can tie that in with the pathology, in with the life history, in with the diet studies, into a whole range of things which you obviously can't do without an animal on the table. Okay, so the next thing we'll do is collect some blubber samples from just behind the dorsal fin. This is probably one of the most important samples we'll collect during the post-mortem. Uh, this feeds into some work we have going in collaboration with a lab, uh, CFAS at Lowestoft, and we look at the man-made contaminants, man-made pollutants. Thanks, man. So we're interested in things like DDT, people will have heard of those, but we're really interested in things called PCBs, which stand for polychlorinated biphenyls. I won't go into too much detail tonight, because we've already done an event on this in the past, but people are interested search on our site or elsewhere, you'll find a lot of work going on at the moment on PCBs and potentially they're quite significant effects on some species. Um, Matt, I'm just going to come over to you yeah. for a moment because you're, you're busily collecting all of the samples there and I know a lot of these will actually go into our archives that's as well. Right, yeah. how, how big are our archives? Have you counted everything yeah. that's in there? <laughs> Um, it, there's definitely over 80,000 samples in the archive, if not over 100. Now. Probably is yeah. now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. It's, it's, it's huge. It's a mixture of everything from frozen samples to formalin fix samples as well. So it's a lot, lot of samples. And is that accessible to researchers outside of, of um, the Yes, yeah, so for, theoretically, if anyone has a, comes to us with a research project, say, I want to look at the genetics of this species of whale, um, we can give them samples for it. So it's very important data, I mean sample set for basically globally, anyone could if they've got a reasonable project. Yeah, so, really valuable yeah. resource. Fantastic. And Rob, sorry, do you carry on? 
So what we'll do next is, is what we call flensing the animals. So we're going to peel the blubber layer off the side of the body. So we'll make some fairly routine cuts. I'm just going to cut this way, so watch out. And then we'll peel the blubber layer away from the body. And then this will help us to expose the underlying structure. And then we'll go into some of the organs as well. So as I'm peeling this away, hopefully it's obvious on camera that the meat, the muscle, is actually pretty dark. Actually, before we do that, let's show you the petrol joint. So, just cutting through that now. If people at home do this, envisioning loads of people to rotate and roll, <laughs> that's called a ball and socket joint, which enables that arm to rotate freely. Cetaceans have exactly the same kind of joint. So, this is the scapula or the shoulder blade, again, just like us. If I show the articulation just there, that's the socket. And then this part is the ball, just like our shoulder blade and arm. So there's, there's actually quite a lot that's similar about us than is different. Okay, yeah, so as I was just saying, the, the muscle itself is actually fairly dark. So this is a lot darker than it would be on, on us. On a terrestrial animal, yeah. No. So these are obviously diving animals, they're um, breath hole divers, so they take a, a lungful of air and then dive down. There's a reason for that, which we probably won't go into tonight. Um, but they need that capacity to stay underwater for a period of time to hunt their prey. So they have a high haemoglobin content in the blood. They also have a high amount of what's called myoglobin. Myoglobin is very similar to haemoglobin, but it's bound up in the muscle instead of in the blood. And essentially, I've heard it said before, that it's like having two aqualungs strapped to your back. This is the main muscle mass that runs along the back of the animal. This is called the longissimus dorsi. If you contract that, the tail goes up. And this is the oppositional psoas muscle. You contract that, and the tail goes down. That provides locomotion through the water. And that amount of myoglobin enables it to stay underwater for longer. They're not the deepest divers. They can breath hold for about 10 minutes, I guess. So the deepest diving to taste on the planet is the Cuvier's beach whale. That can hold its breath. We saw one talk recently, one animal tagged, held its breath for two hours and 45 minutes on one lung of breath, which is quite incredible. Really. That's amazing. So a fantastic adaptation for cetaceans to be able to catch their prey. But I guess then does make them vulnerable to things like bycatch because they've got to come up to the surface to take a breath. Yeah, so if you go back to the idea of, well, let's say trawl type gear, you have some gear in the water mm. uh, to catch fish and it might take an hour to haul it in. If you can hold a breath for two, 10 minutes, you can work, do the mass and work out there's a problem there. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. So the way that trawl type gear works is you throw the net out, tow it behind the boat or two boats. As you bring it in, you actually close that end and bring it up, and there's therefore no, no room for the stations to get out. And the, as the gear's wound in, the gear goes over and over the boat, and it gets into smaller and smaller space towards what's called the cod end, where the fish go, and of course that's then leading to the death of the animals, unfortunately. Okay, so what we'll do next is open up the abdominal cavity. And we'll start to expose the organs. While you do that, Rob, I'm just going to remind anyone uh, watching, don't forget to send us in your questions via Twitter, hashtag CSI of the Sea, or by email to learning at zsl.org. I've got my baseball phone here. We'll be taking a few of those shortly. Okay, so this is the um, <laughs> gruesome sound effect time, I'm afraid. So we've had these for 27 years. Five pounds, unmentioned DIY store. So we're going to just chop through the ribs on one side. Okay. So I'm just going to come behind you. Thanks. And then again, over here. OK, 
Okay, and I'm being quite careful not to uh, touch anything too much because what we're going to do next, Matt's going to take some samples for bacterial culture. <coughs> and really, although we know or suspect we know how this animal died, we'll still go through that detailed post mortem process just in case because you don't know what else you might find. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, so the camera over here. What we're looking at now are some of the organs of the animal. So we've got the left lung, lymph node just here. This is the diaphragm, which enables the lungs to inflate, deflate the surface. Got the liver, we've got the first stomach, because they have three stomach sections. Uh, 40 million years ago, the common ancestor diverged. Some stayed on land and became things like cattle, mm -hmm. and some became cetaceans. So cattle have four stomachs. Dolphins have three. Got the kidney just here and then the long intestinal tract. A couple of things to point out in relation to bycatch. So just here in the roof of the back, hopefully the camera can show you this dark area. In the roof of the back, over here is probably more obvious, you can see this network of kind of a fine, the blood vessels, almost like vermicelli, hopefully that's clear on the camera. These are called reti mirabile or wondrous network network of blood vessels, but the important point is you've got this area of hemorrhage, that's what this dark area is here, and that's something we quite commonly see in bycatch cases. So as they're going through the agonal process of death, they're thrashing around in the gear trying to escape. Not a very pleasant way to die, unfortunately, and then we get this rupture of the blood vessels in the roof of the back here. That's something we do commonly see. The other thing that's interesting to note is here around the kidney, it looks like we've got some fat running through the kidney. And that perirenal fat is something you'll ever see in, in healthy animals. So again, we're building up this picture mm. of a healthy animal that's died acutely in fishing gear. So I'm just going to change gloves and then Matt will get some swabs ready. You've got several pairs of gloves on, Rob. Is there a reason <laughs> for that? It's not too cold in here. Keep you warm like a tramp. <laughs> uh, yeah, so these are uh, Kevlar gloves, is that right, Matt? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's there to prevent you cutting yourself. As I found out to my cost a few weeks ago, best to wear them. So these, if you do cut yourself, it stops it going to skin, hope you just cuts the glove. So your non-cutting hand, you have these on. Okay. And two gloves. Gets a bit less smelly when you're down the pub later on. Right, okay. <laughs> which, which I intend to do, so. <laughs> when I'm raising my pint to my hand, I don't want to, yeah, smell it. Okay. Matt, if someone asked you to describe the, the smell of a, a dolphin necropsy? Is there any way of describing <laughs> it? Um, not easily. Um, I, as somebody once did describe it as a shark eating a pig and then dying. Right. So a very strange mixture of kind of fishy and a meaty kind of smell. Right, but yeah. I don't know. It's, it's very hard to explain. It's yeah. unique. Yeah. It is a unique smell. Maybe also. that's the next event we can just smell a vision and people can experience it at home. Mm. Yeah. People <laughs> often <laughs> ask, yeah. I think they'd like that, but I'm not <laughs> sure if they're ready for it, really. <laughs> Next time. Yeah. Okay. So the other thing to note uh, is this lung's quite pink and inflated, but it is quite dark at this lateral end. But that's coincident with this area of hemorrhage over here, so we'll take some photos just in case. So we have a sterile scalpel blade and some uh, forceps. Just make a cut, expose that lung tissue. Is that not normal to see that, that difference in colour then? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause on that and come mm. back to it later. Okay. The other thing to note about this animal is it was actually very, very fresh when it came in to Strand mm -hmm. and it's still bleeding. So that would tend to suggest whatever had happened to it had happened fairly close to shore. Right. And that's a little bit different compared to our normal bycatch cases. Most common dolphin bycatch cases that we've seen in terms of stranded animals tend to be relatively decomposed because they've died out at sea and then wash up. So <coughs> that would suggest this animal was probably caught fairly close inshore. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to come back to that okay. in a bit. Just uh, put, some, put these in some alcohol in between samples. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Matt, just remind me I've forgotten something. <laughs> which happens a lot. <laughs> I mean, there are, are a lot of different samples that you take. Thanks, mate. <laughs> yeah. 
and I'm getting older. Oh. <laughs> Just do the swabs for this, mate. Rob, while we're um, waiting for a moment, we've had a question through on Twitter from Hooray. Christina. Um, so thank you very much, Christina. Um, and she asks um, whether the animal was alive when it stranded or if it was, was dead. Do we know? Chris thank you, Christina. <laughs> uh, no, it was, found, it was found dead. It was found dead floating just offshore, like 100 yards offshore. There may be a picture we shown earlier. So no, it's seen dead floating in the water as far as I'm aware. Okay, so while we're waiting, we'll just do the kidney. Kidney next, Matt. So as I say, even though we have a fairly clear idea of what's going on, we will routinely take these samples in case something comes back, because you never know what you're going to find. A lot of the, um, some of the bacteria we culture are unique to science, because there's a group of these animals involved in the marine environment. We've seen a range of bacteria that other animals get too, but also some that are pretty unique. And that's part of the attraction of doing this work, to be honest. Even though Matt and I have been doing it for 20 years, seen thousands of post-mortems, there are still things that are absolutely unique to science, and you never know what you're going to find until yeah. you open the animal up. Must make it very exciting. And then liver. Okay. Great, thanks, Matt. As I've opened the liver up there, hopefully the camera will show this, this welling of blood that's coming out. This uh, general picture of, of congestion or of, of uh, a lot of blood in the carcass, that's something you commonly see in bicorp animals. Okay, last sample. Here's the spleen. I might just take these, it's fine. Okay. Right. Sorry. Okay, onwards. Uh, yes, I, I had a question for Matt, although he seems a bit preoccupied with various That's plastic right. bags. Yeah. But and um, Matt, you, you've taken lots of tissue samples, lots yep. of liquid samples, all sorts. Is there anything else you might remove from the the animal as a, a sample? Um, so we will take teeth. Okay. Um, teeth are standard, um, so you can use the teeth to age the, the animal. Um, it's very similar to a tree with growth rings. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking of worms. Parasites. Yes, we also find <laughs> a lot of parasites. Um, dolphins, not so much, but other porpoises you would find regularly with a lot of porpoises. Um, on, even on a healthy animal, you would find a lot of parasites when they're dead. Um, in the lungs, in the stomach, even in the buffering cases as well. Uh, sometimes in the ears. Oh, right. So yeah, they, okay. they get everywhere. And that's stuff that you can yeah collect and then identify, presumably. Yes. Yeah, so date. we we can't identify ourselves. We're not we're not that skilled. <laughs> um, so that gets sent away oh, and I colleagues. Don't know. <laughs> we're not that skilled yet. And <laughs> colleagues at the NHM who who are able to identify the species for us. Fantastic. Okay. okay. Well, we've got a few more questions coming in. So Rob, I don't know if you want. To Mm -hmm. to carry on as I ask you these, or if yeah, there's something you wanted to point out Just first. before we do, mm. so uh, what I'm doing now is taking out each organ system one by one, and we'll go through each one, uh, looking at abnormalities, and I'm taking out the gastrointestinal tract, which is the stomachs, back to the rectum. Blaze is pointing here to these little white tracts running through what we call the mesenteric system, and this is something called chyle. So as they break down uh, prey species, and I can feel something in this first stomach, Mm -hmm. uh, fat runs out into the mesenteric system and that's what we can see there and that'll be evidence of recent feeding. So if you think about our criteria for establishing bycatch animals are fat, healthy, no other evidence of underlying disease, uh, acute death, net marks, evidence of recent feeding, we're beginning to tick off all of those. Okay. But far away. Well, um, we've had a question through by email from Wahaj, thank you very much for that. Um, and 
this question is what happens to the dolphin after the necropsy? So we have seen various bits going into bags. Yeah, uh, good question, Mahaj. Uh, <laughs> so from our perspective, um, all the bits of the animal, not to put too fine a point, and it will be sent away for incineration because they're uh, CITES listed. Uh, that's the advised method of disposal here at this end. Just to put some, an interesting bit of local flavour on this, in the UK I have this awful term called, not awful, uh, it's a term, royal fish, mm. dating back to a statute from 13, uh, something other, where Edward II, II enacted his primacy over all dead dolphins around the English coast, and that was for feeding. So that bit of royal statute is still in place, believe it or not, and theoretically that means that all solicitations belong to the Crown. Now why am I telling you this? It, it means that uh, in, pr in practice, the local landowner is responsible for disposal, which is fine if you've got a small dolphin. If you've got a 30 ton, 15 metre sperm whale, you can get very expensive and very painful very quickly, particularly if you're a caravan site owner who hasn't got a lot of income. And that has happened. So, yeah, that's, that is the, the practicalities of disposal of large whales. Oh, it makes, yeah, having your own private beach sound a little bit more complicated and <laughs> expensive potentially too. Yeah. Um, so we've had some other questions in, including one from Sarah, again on email. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and she asks, what are the main injuries that you see suffered by dolphins? Um, so what inju injuries do you see when they get caught in nets in particular? So I, I guess that's what we're seeing tonight. You can see these net marks around the body and we can see these evidence, this evidence of hemorrhage in the roof of the back. Mm. Very occasionally, in a small number of cases, we've seen some uh, fractures around the skull, perhaps around the ribs, and the th we think what's happening there is as they're brought in over the gear, they may have just been by court uh, and they've just died, and then they get these fractures around the body too. But generally speaking, we would see, in most but not all cases, these uh, net marks, sometimes uh, penetrating marks of the body wall when they're lifted out of nets. Again, I've got to stress, dead. They're dead at this point. They're hoiked out of the gear and over the side. So we see that sometimes as well. Okay. Uh, another question in from Ricardo, um, who's a student at the University of Sussex. He sent one in by email. Thank you very much. Um, kind of referring, I guess, to a lot of the samples we've been taking, can you assess intoxication from microplastics? So is there any way to tell um, whether there's microplastics in the system, I guess, of this animal? So, I'm not sure. Intoxication, I would think about in a completely different kind of way, and that might happen later on tonight in the pub in Primrose Hill, if anyone wants to come and join me. Um, so, yeah, the serious answer to that is we routinely assess stomachs for evidence of plastic uh, ingestion. And obviously, um, plastics are getting a lot of attention, and rightly so at the moment, uh, since the Blue Planet broadcast last year. In 27 years, we've examined stomach contents of every animal, so 4,000 post-mortems, and in, we do see plastics in a small number of cases. There's only ever been one animal where macroplastics have caused, been a causal factor in death. So plastic ingestion of large pieces, although we see it, it doesn't appear to be a significant issue as far as UK surroundings are concerned. Now microplastics, different issue for those who don't know, those are small particles of plastic in the marine environment. We have an ongoing collaboration with the University of Exeter, where we've been collecting the whole gastrointestinal tract for them, and they've been sifting through that GIT, looking for any evidence of mi microplastics, and there's some work on that coming out shortly, but I will leave that there. But there's obviously a lot of work going on on microplastics, not just in the UK, but internationally too. And although I've said that it doesn't appear to be a significant issue in terms of mac macroplastics in strand dissertations in the UK, that doesn't mean it's not an issue elsewhere. It doesn't mean that we should all not strive to leave a less petrochemical lifestyle. Mm. Um, another question which reflects nicely actually on the fact that this is a, a juvenile female is, uh, has come in from Dave on Twitter. So thank you very much, Dave. And he asked, do you find uh, that there's a trend in younger cetaceans in particular being caught as a result of bycatch? Uh, it's a good question, actually. So I guess if we compare the two groups that we are mainly talking about, porpoises and common dolphins, Dave, camera over there, um, what's interesting is you see a high proportion of by caught juvenile porpoises uh, compared to adults, and that's quite something we quite commonly see globally in terms of impact on cetaceans. Interestingly, though, in common dolphins, in terms of stranded animals at least, we see a higher proportion of adult 
animals diagnosed as bycatch. Now, there's a lot of caveats around that. You know, one might be that bigger animals more likely to, to bloat and then more likely to wash up. So we maybe can't read that much into it. On the other hand, it might be that there's some social feeding to these common commodores, in particular, very social species. Perhaps there's some hierarchy to that feeding and adults get in there first, juveniles afterwards, and that might be why they're more likely to be by court. So that's one thing that's come out from this, but I wouldn't want to read too much into it yet. Okay. Well, um, we'll take some more questions from you shortly, um, but while Rob continues, we do have a piece of uh, film footage that we recorded earlier with our senior scientist and pathologist, Paul Jepson, because although tonight we're focusing very much on bycatch in the UK, it is an international issue and it is affecting species across the world. So Paul told us a little bit more about this at an international level earlier on. Bycatch globally is probably the biggest threat that marine mammals face. Um, it's a threat that uh, happens all around the world to different species and has been a major cause of mortality uh, for many decades. Uh, some of the, uh, examples of, of species are uh, Irrawaddy dolphins uh, in the Mekong in Cambodia that I've got personal experience of. And this is an area where the Mekong River is quite a way inland, it's pretty narrow and the dolphins can't really escape when the fishermen cast their nets. It's quite possible to just pitch a net from one side of the river to the other and then the animals really have nowhere to go. And for that population, bycatch is very much the, uh, the main threat. Uh, for other species, uh, like the North Atlantic right whale, uh, these are much larger animals, bigger whales, um, but still the same kind of threat. A long rope from the sea surface to the seabed where the fishermen have their pots and it's this rope um, made, usually made of plastic that is very good at actually entangling these large whales and then they can't escape. And in recent years the population, after starting to recover from many years of whaling, the population started to recover but in the last decade or so this population has started to decline again uh, with bycatch being the number one cause. So people are really worried about this population and the plight just from bycatch alone. Um, and then of course we've got the vaquita, uh, which is the smallest uh, cetacean species on earth, um, but it's very few individuals left in that species because uh, again, they live in a relatively enclosed area in the north of Mexico and they've been suffering bycatch for many years. And in fact, there may only be about 17 or less individuals left in that population. Um, despite the best international efforts. So you can see how from small cetaceans to very large cetaceans, um, this is such a big problem that we have to face, not just here in the UK, but, but globally. Well, hopefully that's given you a better idea of some of the issues uh, which are faced by other species due to bycatch. Um, we're still here in the post-mortem room at the Zoological Society of London. Uh, Rob is carrying on with the necropsy. Rob, you, you mentioned uh, earlier that it's very much about looking for things outside of the norm. Yeah. Is there anything that you've spotted so, so far that's been a surprise or unusual? Or is it as expected? Uh, I guess I have to say, unfortunately for the dolphin, it is as expected. Yeah, so we're building up that picture of an animal that appears to be in good health, that's died suddenly, has evidence of gear entanglement around the outside, and I think we're probably going to see something in the stomachs too. So we have trauma, net marks, recent death, feeding. That's our criteria. Yeah. You've removed some of the organs mm. now. Is there anything in, in particular you'd like to show us? Yeah, so this is the, the liver. I don't know what's left of the liver now. <laughs> in the break we went through it, so it's a large bilobed, two-lobed organ and we've taken out some samples which Matt will collect as well. So in the same way that we're looking at the blubber for the man-made compounds, we'll analyse the liver for the naturally occurring compounds, things like mercury, selenium, zinc, cadmium, lead. We look for those naturally occurring compounds, we'll assess those as well, potentially. We've had uh, another question through on email from Nicole, who has just asked, is this a male or a female um, animal? I'm not sure if this mm. might be a good time. Can we see anything? <laughs> we can. We should have done that right at the beginning, shouldn't we? We missed that bit. OK, let me get some... Um, clean up a little bit here. 
So yeah, cetaceans are easy to sex. If we have the camera back over here, this area. So we have the anal genital region, and then two smaller mammary slits either side. So that's a female, so three holes essentially. In a male, we have the penile slit further forward, anus further back, so two holes male. And they're all broadly the same, apart from some confusing beet wells which have pseudo mammary slits. <laughs> okay, so what's, what's next? What are you doing now, Rob? So uh, we're going to take out what's called a pluck, which is the tongue backwards and down, around and over the heart and the lungs. So basically the cardiovascular system. So I've just dissected out the tongue. Yeah, maps around me again. Something I've forgotten about. Got to keep an eye on me. Because you're on, on camera, Rob. Yeah, yeah. You remember otherwise. Good excuse. And I'm getting older. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so Matt's just going to collect some fluid from around the heart. Got a persistent fly in here. And this pericardial fluid we'll use as a proxy for the blood. And uh, in this instance, we can look at the antibodies in that to see what diseases it's being exposed to whilst it's alive. So again, this is the idea of building up a picture of the animal's life mm -hmm. and its death at the same time. Is that sound of the fluids draining, man. Yes, it is. Yeah. We did have, there was a, a comment on Twitter earlier on from um, Sophie who said, how come there isn't a lot of blood? Um, but hopefully, Sophie, you'll agree with us now that there is a, a fair amount. I guess it was just we hadn't got to it yet, Rob. To quote the Cohen brothers, there will be blood. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, we're cutting around. And here's quite requires a lot of exertion. I've also got a question from Daja on email um, asking if there's an order for the organs which you examine and, and take samples from. Do you try to be quite systematic about it? Yeah, very much so. It is a very methodical uh, process. It's quite a forensic process. So it might seem like we're cowboys, but it's just impressions really. So yeah, we're just going through this methodically taking samples as we go. And these are routine samples that we'll collect in every post-mortem examination. We're expediting things a little bit to fit it in the hour and a half process, but we'll carry on after the facts and finish off the rest as well. The other thing to point out, we haven't talked about this, is the reproductive tract. So in my hand on this camera here, this is the left ovary. And the right ovary is over here. So we've got the camera going down that way. Hopefully you can see this sort of Y shape. These are the horns of the uterus, and these are indeed immature. So this is all very consistent with a young juvenile animal rather than an adult. If it was an adult, the uterus would be much bigger, so it, it, it might indicate it's had a calf in the past, and there'd be some scarring on the ovary. So at the end of the post-mortem, we'll also collect the ovaries too, because that will go into some life history studies with some colleagues elsewhere. Okay. Matt, you got a... Uh, Tray. I'll pop these over there as well. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Okay, so perhaps we'll move over to that table there. Okay. And we'll carry on with these samples. While you're changing gloves and preparing bits, um, we've had a question through from Flo, who is seven years old. Um, so thank you ever so seven. much. Yeah, wow. there you go. Thanks, Flo, for your question, because she asks, what subjects did you choose at school to become a scientist? So I'm going to ask you both that, because I think it's a good question. It's a really good question. Thanks, Flo. Uh, so I personally did biology, chemistry, and physics at A-level. And I've got to be honest, I struggle with physics. So biology and chemistry are much more my uh, forte. <laughs> yeah, mine's the same, uh, pretty much biology, uh, chemistry, and some other general kind of exams. So. Okay. Um, not maths, that's for sure. <laughs> um, Matt, we've also had a question through from Rosie and her children. And yeah. they've asked why you and Rob aren't wearing, well, and I suppose me too, aren't wearing masks. Is it necessary to wear? Masks for this kind of work? Well, so they, 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 
which camera are we on? That one. So we do, they do carry, I think it's a question, they do carry what's called zoonoses, which are diseases that can affect humans. But really the risk to us is through cutting, so that's why we wear a cut-proof glove. It's not really from the aerosol. At the end of the post-mortem, we, we, if we have time, we'll try and take the brain out, and you'll see we do have a, a mask going over the front of the head, try and prevent inhalation that way. But it's not really a risk, it's mainly about sharp blades on the hand rather than inhalation risk. Fantastic, okay. Well, um, what, what have you got here in front of us? Okay, so we've got the, the lungs which are a little bit more darker and congested, so darker red at the kind of bottom half, a little bit paler over here. And then running up, we've got the tongue and then the larynx. So these are breath hole divers. The larynx fits into the entrance of the blow hole and they breathe to the top of the head. So we're going to start by going down into what we call the uh, oropharynx, which is this area around the larynx, really. And if we had more time, we could also talk about how they echolocate. For those who are really interested in knowing that, because I don't think we'll have time today, one of our previous videos is online. It is, it And is, you can definitely. see more than there. So we have had some people asking um, if you'll be able to watch this event afterwards. Um, and there will be a recording of this going on our website. Um, so all you need to type in is www.vedsl.org forward slash CSI of the Sea, and you'll be able to see the recording of this event um, after today, but also the previous event that we ran as well, which is all about pollutants and those PCBs in particular that Rob mentioned, so you can watch that as well. So I've just checked the um, aorta, which is this big blood vessel I'm holding in my hand. So that's the one that David Attenborough says, in a blue whale, you can actually swim up, because it's that big, which puts the size of the animal in perspective. I should perhaps also mention again as an interesting aside, we have had blue whales stranding historically in the UK. The Natural History Museum have a data set going back to uh, 1913, which is a fantastic and pretty unique resource. And that's quite useful because we can see changes in distribution of strandings over time for some species in particular. So one, perhaps we can talk about while I'm doing this, is the humpback whale, uh, where we had no strandings at all during the early part of the data set and we've begun to see strandings over the last 25, 30 years. And that's actually good news, which is a bit, bit paradoxical. Mm. So some people will know that we actually banned most commercial whaling, not all, in 1986. The ban was signed into effect in Brighton, my hometown. Hooray. Uh, and then since that ban or moratorium on whaling, some of those populations are beginning to recover at sea, particularly humpback whales. They're doing phenomenally well in many parts of the world. Still a long way to go to come back to pre wading levels, but they are coming back. And as a corollary, more of them out there, we've begun to see strandings around the UK. So although it's bad news for the individual, it's actually quite good for the population as a whole. Yeah. Tells you more than that. OK, so while I was nattering, I've opened up the airways, and well, it, it doesn't really come over on the camera, but I can feel that the lung tissue is really uh, rubbery. Mm -hmm. There's some uh, crack crackling. That crackling is emphysema. Uh, we've got little ruptures in the alveoli in the lungs with some bleeding out of some of the air. And that's causing this crackling. And then we've got this froth, this persistent froth in the airways. No seawater, which people are often surprised at. So cetaceans have... <coughs> a different autonomic response to humans. When they lose consciousness underwater, they don't begin to inhale or aspirate seawater. So paradoxically, in drowning cases in stations, you never, very hardly ever see water in the airways, always dry. This is actually more akin to suffocation. So as they're beginning to go through the agonal process of death in the nets, the airways are working back and forth, and there's a mucus lining to the airways. And as the walls touch each other, they whip up this persistent froth, which persists days, weeks after death. Mm -hmm. The other thing we can perhaps see, if one of those cameras can pick it out, I know you like a nice parasite, <laughs> is just here, these little thread-like parasites coming out. Is that clear on the camera? Maybe. Don't pick them out. These are probably a species called Halocircus delphini. Just in the back of my glove, there's one of them there. Just that little thread-like parasite there. We will assess the relative burden. It's the relative burden that's important. So is it heavy? Is it light? Is it moderate? There's one there. 
for the camera over that side. Just my little finger pointing it out. And this is obviously light. So the lungs themselves feel very spongy, very resilient. That's a diving adaptation as they come to the surface. Everyone's heard uh, that explosive exhalation as they come to the surface. The lungs are very rubbery and they collapse when they go below a certain depth. And as they come back up to the surface, the they blowhole opens up and then this, they spring back open. It's massive uh, inrush of air and exhalation of the old air. So we talk about tidal volume, how quickly we can exchange gas. So I'm an ex-smoker, so I've got awful don't smoke is awful tidal volume. Um, I can exchange maybe five, ten percent of my breath in one lung capacity in one breath. Cetaceans can do 90 percent, so really efficient wow. gas exchangers, and that's again another diving adaptation. Okay, we'll flip that over. So the lungs are normal basically, mm -hmm. and we'll look at the heart. This is the heart in my left hand, four chambers, just like us. So two atria, two ventricles, one thick wall side to send it around the body, and then one thin wall side to send it to the lungs. Just open that up. These, these clots, they're, they're normal. We would see those normally in animals that's gone through this process. I'm just going to check what we call the tricuspid valves, and their valves stop the blood flowing the wrong way. And we have them as well. Try not to flick you. Got a habit of doing that. Okay, so it might not be very clear. Again, not sure which camera we're on. But here we have these three pockets. There's one, there's a second one, and there's a third, and they're intact. And, and why are we checking that? We've occasionally had a few animals, lots of fat around the heart. Again, that's consistent with healthy animal. A few animals with infection of those valves, and we're just trying to tick things off. Really. Okay. Well, we've had quite a few uh, comments and questions coming through about the guts and the mm. intestines. Don't worry, we are going to be getting on onto that shortly. And um, also, I have to give a big shout out to Jessica in Australia, because she's watching live, and it's 4 a.m. there, so that's a real commitment. Thank you very much, Jessica. Thanks for joining us. Wow. <laughs> Reach the parts of other projects. Okay, so guts back over there. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so for the morbid, morbidly curious audience out there, and I'm glad you're with me on the want to see the guts front. <laughs> if we look at them first of all before we open them up. As I said earlier, cetaceans have three stomach sections. So this is the first. This is the cardiac stomach, and I can feel some contents in there. This is the second, the fundic, and then this is the third, the pyloric. And they feed into this long intestinal tract. And before anyone else asks an awkward question, yes, there is a large and a small intestine, but I, I find it quite hard to differentiate them. So this is where it's going to get a bit fragrant, I'm afraid for the benefit of the cameraman. <laughs> Just took a step backwards. Yeah, a step backwards. <laughs> so we'll open up the cardiac stomach first of all. So the, this stomach is quite thick-walled to withstand the very acidic enzymes that are involved in digestion. So it's very acidic, sort of pH 2 and a half, 3, and that takes the flesh off the fish or the prey species fairly quickly. Okay, so there is some evidence of recent feeding here. Don't know, Matt's going to take a picture so we can document this. Someone who's particularly interested in this part of uh, the post mortem, Rob, is Kit, who is aged six. It'd be great to know if anyone younger than that yeah. is watching. Um, An audience. And, uh, and Kit really wanted to know what the intestines look like. So, well, There you go, Kit. So you can see there's a kind of long intestinal tract here leading out from the stomachs. So the longest intestinal tract of any animal on the planet, I think, belongs to the sperm whale, as, as we can testify to from yes. bitter experience. Okay, so uh, I won't, I'll try and program a little bit here to show you what we're talking about. We've got some, some bones. 
So there's a recently ingested prey item. I have literally no idea what that is before anyone emails in. <laughs> this is another sample we'll collect for some collaboration with colleagues. So these will go off to our close partners, the Sea Mammal Research Unit, for analysis of stomach contents. And what I'm really trying to look for here are the otoliths or the ear bones of fish. So I'll see if I can find one to show you what I mean. And can you identify the species of fish then just from the ear bone? Yeah, so the otolith is a, is a kind of ovoid, okay, there's one, ovoid bone. I'm going to drop it now. Mm. <laughs> Come on. Stubborn bugger. Right, okay, thanks Matt. Try and put it back. So, back of my glove, that kind of whitish bone, just here. This is one of the otoliths. So they're uh, diagnostic to the kind of prey species. So each fish will have different kind of otoliths, and we can identify what they've been feeding on from that. So put that back in, have a, have a little poke around. We're looking for any evidence of ulcers mm -hmm. or parasites. And person to one of the last questions, plastic. So there is no plastic in this animal that I can see. Just some bones, this beige digester, and then this fish, which, well, I presume it's a Tedios fish, has got some flesh adhering to it. So again, this is all consistent animal that's been recently feeding. Mm -hmm. Um, we have had a question in from Logan by email, um, which links nicely to this, because Logan asks, what's the weirdest thing you've found in the stomach of a cetacean? Thames whale. Well. <laughs> Not really. In the Thames whale, well, they found a potato in the stomach. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> um, so we presume that obviously it was ingested, was mm. it was actually in the shallows of the water, so debris floating around. We found crisp packets before, mm. but only small fragments, nothing mm. which would have actually caused any issues. But I think potatoes are the strangest thing I can remember. Yes, yeah, so I suppose the other weirdest thing is, is our N equals 1 or 1 case of death by plastic ingestion. Mm. So that, in this instance, that, that did was a causal factor mortality. It was a Cuvier's B12 that stranded in Scotland. Our colleagues from the Scottish Marine Animal Stranding Scheme. I should have said right at the outset, this is a collaborative project. Us at ZSL are only a small part of this network. There are other networks across the country. So the team in Scotland, there's a group in Wales, Marine Environmental Monitoring. There's uh, the National History Museum. There's also the Cornwall Wildlife Trust and University of Exeter in Cornwall. Anyway, we're all involved in the project. And our Scottish colleagues went to this Cuvier's B12 and found it had plastics throughout the stomach compartments in um, quite dramatic style. But as I said earlier, that's one animal. Mm. It's the negative data that's also equally important. We've had 4,000-ish cases where it's not been an issue. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm just trimming that stomach away. I'm going to pop that into a bag. Right. Okay, so that was the cardiac stomach. So moving forward, this is the next stomach. This is the fundic stomach, and it's got a very different appearance to the stomach wall. It's quite folded to increase the surface area, and this produces the enzymes. So the enzymes are secreted here, they're refluxed or passed back into the first stomach takes the flesh off the fish, and then flesh off the fish, be careful you say that, mm -hmm. and then flushes it through into the next stomach, and this is the um, pyloric stomach here. And this is where we add, we, it's where the dolphin adds bile to the mix, I'm afraid that's where it's going to get quite smelly now, sorry chaps. Um, okay, so there's a lot of fluid gushed out there. Again, this is um, digester, as that is washed out. You can see quite a few things in here, I'll pick them out. Got a couple of um, fish eyeballs on the back of my glove. And it looks like a few otoliths ear bones here as well. And then some other prey content. Okay but that otherwise looks normal. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to go into the intestinal tract. And with the intestine, 
we don't go through the whole length of it. We just open up uh, a representative sample here and there to see what's going on. I guess we're trying to see uh, is there any evidence of intestinal parasitism? We've occasionally had a few tapeworms, haven't we, Matt? Yes, not, not many, but... Not for a while either, but we'll just tick that off the list. So open intestine, hopefully the camera shows we've got these folds. Again, that increases the surface area so you can absorb more the nutrients. Okay. And we'll just nip that here and there. Um, I must just say at this point that Kit has been pipped to the post because apparently Sophia, who is nine months old, is watching this evening as an alternative to bedtime reading. So, thanks, Sophia. Wow. Well, <laughs> I don't have to say to that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, Rob, I know you mentioned before about the fact that they've got three stomachs. Um, yeah. We've had a question through on Twitter asking sort of why this this is, d presumably it just aids in, in digestion? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's a good question. I don't really know for sure. I suppose I'd say that some of the more, um, so some of the beaked whales, which are deep divers that feed primarily on squid, they only have, some of them only have two stomachs. Mm -hmm. Squid probably easier to break down. So I, I would imagine, a bit like cattle at chewing cud, it's just going to aid digestion. So I think that's probably reasonable, yeah. So we can see that each stomach has a very different appearance and is doing a different task, I guess that aids digestion. Mm. And I suppose I didn't say as well that when they break down the flesh from the fish, we think they might actually vomit most of the bones back up afterwards, because we tend not to see any bones in intestinal tract. And when we do see it, it, it sometimes means there's something wrong with them. That's great, because you've just answered oh, Tom's wow. question on Twitter, uh, which was all about what happens to, to the bones and do they break down. So it's likely that the animals actually bring them back up. Yeah, we don't know for sure. I think there's been a few um, semi-wild dolphins that have been seen doing that. Um, so I think about one particular Bahamas where you can see it actually vomiting bones up after feeding. But I think from our perspective, we think that's probably the case because we see bones in the first stomach, less in the second, few in the, in the third, and then very rarely in the intestinal tract. And then I think for those that have been with us throughout this CSI the Sea journey, you might remember call the first animal we examined two, a year and a half ago. And that had bones packing out that mm. first stomach, so that was something pathological. There was something wrong with it. Yeah. Okay, so just nipping this open a few places, I can see a picture here of pockets of digester. So it's been feeding, certainly at around the time of death, but it's been feeding before that quite happily as well. Let me just check the rectal end. Okay. So that's probably it with on the guts front, Matt. Okay, yep, got cool. the samples. All right, Excellent. so we'll go back to the head over here. Okay, well um, at this point we're going to show you another film of Paul Jepson um, because I asked him earlier on about um, mitigation, me 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 mitigation methods um, and what's being done to try and reduce the number of uh, bycatch that's being seen across the world sort of at an international level. So this is what Paul had to say. So in terms of mitigation of the bycatch problem, there are solutions, uh, and some, in some cases, some very good solutions where the problem can be either alleviated or, or, or stopped altogether in certain instances. Um, an example would be uh, the use of pingers, uh, which are sort of uh, acoustic devices that you can attach to nets. And they actually like the name Pinger, they ping and you uh, get a sound produced uh, on a regular um, basis. And this has been shown for some species to really significantly reduce the rate of bycatch by alerting the uh, porpoise or dolphin to the presence of the net. Um, and in some parts of the world um, where they have a big bycatch problem, the use of pingers uh, has been um, mandated by policy and that has been uh, effective. Um, there are also other areas, uh, certain areas where there's high rates of bycatch at certain times of year. You can get sort of seasonal closures of a particular fishery in a particular area if there's a high bycatch problem, but then the fishery can continue in other parts of the uh, year, and that's been successful as well. Um, and then there are also uh, other sort of technological solutions that may not be here yet, but are being talked about in the pipeline. 
uh, the sort of inter uh, creel ropes uh, that catch the large whales like the right whales. We're very worried about that, but there may be some sort of acoustic devices that could um, connect the, uh, the pot on the seabed with the, with the lobster all the way up to the sea surface. And, and, and that was a way of actually getting around having the rope in the place. So this is a sort of an example of uh, a sort of innovative technical, technological solution that people are working on. And we hope that these will be more successful and give us even more tools in the armory to uh, combat the bycatch problem in the future. So Rob, we've just uh, heard from Paul there talking about uh, mitigation of bycatch. What's, what's sort of the case here in the UK? So there have been lots of attempts to uh, mitigate against the impact of bycatch. I think it's worth just stating again that uh, fishermen don't want to catch cetaceans. Mm -hmm. So also worth stating again, around the UK we have a lot of fishing activity, a lot of international fishing activity, so it's not just a UK issue. It's a European issue and it's a global issue and really we all collectively need to work together on this to try and address it as a problem moving forward. So in terms of mitigation, lots of things we've looked at in the past. Things like uh, putting barium sulphate in fishing gear to make them acoustically visible, so cetaceans might be able to visualise them more easily with their, their echolocation. But I think really the focus, the only other thing we could do is, is have sort of targeted close down of fisheries at certain times of the year. Mm. The, the focus really now is on use, the use of pingers, because they are very acoustic animals. Using pingers as a deterrent to try and deter them from entering the fishing gear or coming close to it, that's probably the main focus now in terms of trying to mitigate against the impact of bycatch. But I think it's also true that no one solution is going to tick the box for everything. Mm -hmm. One thing we haven't talked about tonight, if I can mention it briefly, is the issue of large whale entanglement, which is a form of bycatch. And that's where you have uh, a lobster pot rope or a crab pot at the bottom with a rope going up to a boy on the surface. And that's what you traditionally thought was a fairly benign kind of fishery because you're not having stuff trawling along the seabed or pulling through the midwater column. Unfortunately now, we are seeing an increasing number of entanglements, as Paul just said, uh, of some species in the UK and globally. And again, that's something we need to try and address moving forward as well about that increasing issue. Because it is increasing because we're seeing more of them out there, ergo, more case of entanglement. And as consumers, I, I suppose there, there's no particular, or is there particular fishing techniques that pose less of a threat to cetaceans? That's a tough one. Mm. I'm not sure I can answer that readily. I, th I think it's probably fair to say that there's no... No form of fishery with, with zero kind of impact on the environment. You know, that, that's probably true for all our activities. Nothing yeah. is truly harmless. Uh, there are probably some that are better than others. I guess in terms of people out there looking to buy fish, you look for the MCS symbol, mm -hmm. and we're accredited with MCS, we work with MCS. Look for that symbol to indicate that that fishery is perhaps more sustainable in terms of the impact on the fish, and hopefully they'll tie that into perhaps the impact in terms of bycatch as well. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're watching um, and using Twitter, we will share some of those links for you as well. Um, so, you've removed the head, Rob. Yeah. And um, what, what happens next? Okay, so I've taken uh, some teeth out for Matt. I'll pass these through. So, again, to show the camera. I think we saw them earlier. But you can see their very pointed teeth. And that reflects their feeding ecology. They're chasing fish through the midwater column. They've got to catch those fish and then acrobatically throw them in the mid, through the midwater and then swallow them ahead first so the, the fins don't get stuck down the throat. Mm -hmm. And we collect those because we can use those to age them. So just like trees, essentially, there are rings or lines on, on the inside of the tooth. Every year you get a deposition layer or line, and that's how we age them. And this animal, I guess, would be you know, between three to eight-ish years old, ish. Okay. Okay, the next thing we will do is, I think we're gonna take the brain out. Right. And then if we have time, we'll talk about echolocation. <laughs> so I've trimmed some tissue off the back of the skull, just to expose the skull. If we, actually, if we rewind a little bit, go back to first principles, there are two groups of cetacean. There are the odontocetes with teeth, like this one here, 
And then mysticetes. Mysticetes don't have teeth, they have baleen instead, and that's part of their feeding ecology as well. All odontocetes have the melon. This is soft, fleshy mass here. This is all soft tissue. The skull is actually here with the brain on the inside. Okay, so we're going to use a circular saw. Matt's got over there. And that's actually a saw that they use in hospitals to take off casts when your broken arm is healed okay. And the idea is it cuts solid uh, bone but not soft tissue. That's the idea. Uh, while you're putting more gloves on, Rob, <laughs> um, we've got a question that's come through from Thomas on email. Um, and he asks, if a boat bycatches a cetacean, do they have to inform someone? So, uh, gosh, that's a tricky one as well. So there's no obligation on, on fishermen to report it. Some have, actually, historically. Mm. Again, I go back to my, my earlier point that fishermen don't want to catch cetaceans. It's obviously tragedy to do that, and it does happen. In fact, I was in Brighton the other day, getting a taxi, chatting away to him, and it turns out his next fisherman, he said, yeah, I caught one once. You know, so they're under no, no obligation to report it. What we do have in the UK is uh, a network of, of really committed volunteers that work on fishing vessels, and this is work coordinated by the Seaman Research Unit, and they're bycatch observers. They will document what's by caught from non-target fish to birds to seals to cetaceans they record that and then we scale it up across the fleet as a whole and that's something that's happened across Europe piecemeal some countries better than others uh, and that regulation snappily title 812 2004 under review we're not sure where that's going to go but um, that is work that, did, that is carried out and Paul earlier mentioned on at a, an international level some species of cetacean are under threat, you know, they're, they're mm. close to extinction because of bycatch, but that isn't the case in the UK. I guess that's a tricky one to get onto. I guess what we can say is we don't have a vaquita here, mm. we don't have a North Atlantic right whale. So the vaquita, horrendously endangered population with what Paul said about 30 animals, 30 individuals left. We don't have that situation here in the UK. We have a lot of bicorp, common dolphins and porpoises. I think it's unclear about the population level impact because we don't know how many are caught, we don't really know the effective size, population size out there, so it's therefore harder to work out the potential conservation impact. I think hopefully ton tonight's post-mortem does show it's definitely a welfare problem, because we can see that from the pathology we've seen with this animal here. The conservation problem, I think, requires further work. Okay. Well, you've got your mask there. I'm going to step back as well. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to make the cut over the top and then around the back. cuts over the top of the skull, around the back. These are the condyles that articulate the head so you can do that with your head, again similar to us. I'm not sure how good this will look. Why is it important to be able to look at the brain, what are you trying to find out with this part of the process? Well, I guess we're trying to show the audience at home what a cetacean brain looks like, yes. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> but I guess the other thing is we're ticking things off the list, you know. Is there any evidence of disease in this animal, even though it's pretty clear what's happened to it? Is there any evidence of disease that might be an underlying factor? Mm -hmm. So this membrane I'm cutting away is called the dura mater, which covers the brain. Matt will take a swab of the brain itself. So again, we're looking for any evidence of infection. And then I'll try and lift the brain out and see how that looks. Have you got clean hands, Matt? Yeah. Do you want to get a fresh blade in? Thank you. So 
So for the camera uh, over here, one of these two, we've got, in case it all goes horribly wrong, trying to take it out, we've got two parts of the brain, broadly speaking. This is the cerebrum. This is the voluntary control, the kind of the id and the ego in you and I. Underneath that is the cerebellum with the spinal cord sticking out. And that's the unconscious control, so heartbeat, um, breathing and so on. You may cut just there now. Go through into the meninges and then take a swab. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. And then down. Yeah. Thanks, mate. Super. Okay. I'm going to try and take the brain out for you. Which is a bit of a delicate task. So we're just freeing up the attachments that connect the brain at various points. So there we go, there is a cetacean brain, which came out all right, actually. So hopefully that's what it looks like for the camera. Again, the idea is we've got this two halves of the cerebral cortex, or the cerebrum, not as folded as the human brain, people will see that, but it's still a highly specialised uh, mammalian brain. And underneath that we've got the uh, large, very large cerebellum with the spinal cord sticking out. It looks to be pretty normal, just cut through into the brain, check the meninges, which is just in here, we're check, making sure there's no build up of fluid, no signs of infection, and it looks pretty normal. Okay, so how are we doing for time? Good, so we've got um, a couple more questions, and then I know you're very keen to show us how dolphins echolocate. Um, first question is from Jago, um, who would like a shout out, just like his brother. So hello Jago, um, aged nine, um, and he asks, do dolphins get the bends? That's a good question. That is a great question. We've got a really intelligent audience out here tonight. So thanks for that question, Jago. Yes, they, they can actually. And um, that's largely been shown, to be honest, uh, by work here and then in conjunction with some colleagues in the Canary Islands. So a very long story short, we have had a small number of animals washing up with bubbles throughout the body, uh, in the liver, in the kidney, in other organs as well. And again, a long story short, when you analyse some of those bubbles, you find high levels of nitrogen, so about 95, 96%, uh, which helps confirm it's a decompression sickness-like condition. And then to be a bit more technical, if I can briefly, the, the thing that's commonly voiced, well, they're not like divers, they haven't got an aqualung on their back, but they are repetitively breath hold diving. They're going up and down and up and down and up and down. And that produces risk to that developing this decompression sickness-like condition. And going back to this idea of Cuvier's beaked whales in particular, that can hold their breath for nearly three hours and dive down to 3,000 metres, they're particularly at risk of developing decompression sickness. Why is that important? Well, there's been lots of mass strandings all around the world in association with naval activity, mainly involving Cuvier's beaked whales and other beaked whale species, probably because they've been exposed to quite a high source of sonar, scares them to the surface and they stay there. And we're actually working quite closely with the Royal Navy here in the UK to try and look at mitigating uh, the impact of our activities in terms of impact on cetaceans. Okay, and then a final question from Rachel on Twitter, um, who asks, can dolphins breathe through their mouth or only their blowhole? Wasn't it that uh, dolphin in New Zealand that was breathing through its mouth? which has been seen breathing through its mouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's got dislocated. Larynx. Yeah. Yeah, so one. <laughs> but <laughs> ordinarily, no, they don't. So they breathe to the top of the head through the blowhole, which is just here. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to uh, the lungs, which are over there, I showed you the larynx, which is the, or the goose beak, fits into the blowhole. So that's a bit of a problem, first of all, because if you're trying to eat fish, which go down that way, you've got a big obstruction in the way. 
so they can actually dislocate the larynx, stops breathing, and then the fish goes down into the stomach. Um, so cetaceans, if we go on to how they echolocate, mm, definitely. Well, they, they have to go <gasps> and then dive down. So they, that's called inspiration diving. So they dive on inspiration because they need that air to make noise. So that depth... <laughs> Got someone outside the back door. Live TV. <laughs> so uh, at, at depth, they begin to echolocate by sending pulses of air up into the blowhole, through mm -hmm. the larynx. There's a muscular larynx here, um, sphincter here that contracts and relaxes, sends pulses of air up into the blowhole. And then it goes past a set of structures called the monkey lips or phonic lips. This is very quick because we've got a couple minutes left <laughs> and crude dissection. <laughs> so if you imagine when you blow a trumpet your lips fit against the trumpet part it, it's very similar there's a similar idea here to these monkey lips I'm not sure it's going to come out very clearly now this camera over here quite closely okay. what I'm trying to show you are these monkey lips as I pull back and I'm going to pull quite hard can you come down? Is that possible? Okay, so there's a soft fleshy pad just there, sort of greyish in colour, I'm holding out. Is that clear? See that? Yeah, that's called a monkey or a phonic lip. So basically they're held quite tightly against the front of the skull like this. The pulse of air goes past them, it pushes it away, and then because they're held quite tightly, they snap back under elastic tension, step away, and they make a noise. You send pulses of air, and then you get flipper, and that's how they make the noise. I won't show you, but just here in this area, there are uh, air-filled sacs called vestibular nasal sacs, technical term. The air stops the, most of the sound coming up and pushes most of it through the front of the head instead. And again, quick and crude dissection, if we just take a section out of the melon. Okay. I'm just taking a quick cross section through that. So this camera here, we can see this melon is basically a big ball of fat with this red muscular attachments underneath there. The muscles contract and relax and they change physically the shape of that ball of fat. And that actually modulates the sound wave going through the melon, so it changes its pitch and its frequency out to the target fish. And it's like the idea of the Second World War submarine. That's the short, good submarine, short of the interval, the closer the object is. And the idea, I think, is that the sound is received along the lower jaw along what we call the acoustic fats, and they hit the ear, the tympanic bullet, and then it goes into the brain. So that's the kind of simple explanation of the pathway. But to put it into context, these guys have got amazing biosonar, far more evolved than anything we've managed to develop in a submarine. They cannot just tell, you know, how far away it is, it's, can I eat it, what is it, how many are there, which heading they're going, can I eat it, is it going to fight me, can I, whatever with it, you know, all these different things, lots of granularity with their biosonar, which is an incredibly evolved mechanism, certainly far better than anything we've come up with. Fantastic. Well, um, it has been a bit of a whistle-stop tour this evening, um, but we've carried out a large part of, of the post-mortem. Is, is there anything else that you'll now <coughs> need to collect, Rob? Yeah, when the cameras stop rolling, we'll, we'll collect a few more samples, which you don't need to see. I get, perhaps it's useful just to summarise. Definitely, go for it. OK, so what we've seen tonight then, was the post-mortem of a juvenile female uh, common dolphin that stranded in Devon a fortnight ago. Uh, it's found dead, stranded just off, sh floating dead just offshore. Uh, it's in good nutritional condition. It appears to have died acutely. It has evidence of multiple net marks all over the body. Uh, the pathology is consistent with asphyxiation, submersion death in fishing gear, evidence of recent feeding and some uh, evidence of internal trauma. So, a, a classic, if you want to call it that, bycatch case. Certainly, definitely a bycatch case. And all the samples and things that you've taken this evening, which are going to be analysed further in the lab, mm. how long does it take for those results to come back? 
So the batch of old results, depending on what they find, and it could be clean, nothing there, yeah. which is generally the case, to be honest, with, with bycatch cases, they tend to be healthy. If there's something there, maybe a week or so, and then that will be concluded. So what I think we'll try and do is we'll put a, a summary up on the ZSL site, on our social media. People can read more about it. We'll put some images up there to illustrate this as well. Um, and and if, I, if I may, uh, just mention to the audience, for those that are based in London, this is like a, a little window into the work we carry out, but there'll be a, a greater discussion about the issue of bycatch with some speakers from here and around the UK looking at issue of bycatch on the Tuesday the 10th of April mm. here at ZSL Meeting Room. So come along to that if you want to learn more about the problem of bycatch. Well, details about that event um, are on our website. If you go to www.zsl.org forward slash CSI of the C, and it's that same page where we will put the final results from this necropsy as well. Also on there, you can obviously find out more about other projects that are being carried out at ZSL, as well as further information about the Cetacean Strandings Investigation Program and all their many partners that you mentioned earlier on, Rob. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We've had so many questions. It's been great to know that uh, so many of you are watching us. We have been trying to answer as many of those questions as we can on Twitter throughout the event. So hopefully the team behind the scenes have managed to get through a lot of those. We will try and respond to any email questions um, that have come through as well over the next few days. Um, but can I just ask you a little favour from us? We would really appreciate your feedback. We want to know what you thought of the event, where you've been watching from, what we can perhaps do in the future. So on that same web page underneath the window you've been watching us on, um, there is a link to a survey. It's very short, only five minutes, um, but please do fill it out to let us know what you thought of the event. And hopefully that link is also going onto Twitter as well. So fill it in um, and let us know your comments but um apart from thanking the team behind the scenes our amazing camera crew and uh, those staff who've been manning twitter and email it just leaves me to thank both rob and matt for letting us observe you at work it's been much appreciated and to say goodbye thank you very much for joining us thank you thank you